I'm Ek Pagiti. Today, I had a conversation with Ken Cruikshank. Ken is a professor in teaching English to speakers of other languages in the Sydney School of Education and Social Work at the University of Sydney. Ken is also the director of the Sydney Institute for Community Language Education at the University of Sydney. Today, I asked him several questions. For example, his interest in TESOL and TESOL research, his current research projects, as well as his advice for high research degree students in TESOL, postgraduate students in TESOL, and teachers of English. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Thank you, Ken. So, um, so I have some questions that I would like to ask you. Mm -hmm. So, the very first question is, you know, what what actually attracted you to do to become a TESOL person or to do to choose a career in in TESOL? Um, I think it was even before I went to university. I did a lot of travelling and. Um, in places where English wasn't the main language, so I went through the experience of learning French and Italian as a second language speaker, and I realised how hard it was. Mm -hmm. So when I went to uni, I was interested in languages, and then when I got into teacher training, I chose TESOL because I think I understood how difficult it was to learn a second language and, and just um, what it meant in terms of reality, the way you see yourself. Mm -hmm. So that was always my interest. Oh, okay. Yeah. So and then, um, so now, t tell us a little bit more about your teaching experiences uh, in in this sort of area. I've been teaching TESOL for fifty years or more, mm -hmm. more, and um, I like it because it's it's so rewarding. It's better than other areas. You know, when you succeed, when the students learn, I learn as much about them as they do about. English. So I learn about different cultures, different backgrounds, and I learn as much as they do, I think. And uh, it's just rewarding. You know that yourself. You mentioned rewarding. Like, in what way do you, uh, do you feel like it's rewarding uh, in terms of, you know, solving some problems or I improving um, It's two lives. things. Um, the lecturer I learned from, she saw teaching as problem solving and she said if I can manage to know how to get something across like you do in your teaching how can I get across the ideas how can I get across the concepts and that's always a challenge um, rewarding because the students are usually so interested in learning and you can tell when you succeed mm -hmm. that's what's good about okay. it yeah that, that's 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 very uh, nice Re reassuring well, you're the same aren't you reassuring no. uh, what what we have to do <laughs> in this career yeah. um okay um so now can, can you actually now tell me your um current research uh, project or, or what, what you do currently because I know I looked up your mm. um, profile and then you mentioned um, communi community mm. langu languages um, TESOL areas and so on. I could choose community languages I'll, I'll choose TESOL first because um, what I'm doing at the moment is looking at the teaching of English through science mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the traditional stuff separates language from science. So it talks about the genres of science or it talks about the vocabulary and the grammar. But what I wanted to start with was looking at what, the, what science is, what science learning is, and therefore what language fits into it. So it started, this will take a while, but it started with me sitting down with other science, science um, lecturers, so looking at what do we have in common? Mm -hmm. How do I understand mm -hmm. science? What are the key concepts? What's the normal pedagogy? And what aligns with TESOL? And then we started working with science teachers in schools, and it was interesting because for science teachers, often they realised that science is a, sick, a second language for right, them. Right. They had to learn it that way. Mm -hmm. And I found some interesting things, so that in the science curriculum, 
it's very applied research. They start very much with the idea of everyday problems, then getting into scientific knowledge, and then translating that into some sort of presentation or solution for an everyday issue. And this aligned with Tesla pedagogy. So a lot of task-based learning is very much um, no, not looking just at the language, but in doing something with that and the language involved in it. So with this behind us, we started working with um, 10 different schools. We got the science teachers, the AL teachers in Sydney, working together in Sydney. in Sydney, yes. Lower SES schools with very low outcomes. And we got the science teachers in working with the ESL teachers. How would you, um, w what are the problems, what are the issues, what can be a task-based outcome? At one of the schools, they chose um, uh, the, 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 the functions of parts of the body. And a lot of these um, children, they interpreted for their parents with doctors. And so we got those students to be doctors themselves, mm -hmm. and they had to work out how, how they would explain and give advice about different illnesses and what was wrong. And it was interesting because... First of all, it started with a real-life problem, and it ended up with an outcome, which was them role-playing as doctors. But along the way, we had to teach all the formal language. Right. Now, for these kids, they didn't like formal English. But when they put on the doctor's coats, they were playing a role, and they used that language. Mm -hmm. no? So uh, I'll get to the point in a minute. At another school, it was getting the students to look at problems with iPhones. And the actual science concept was the, um, uh, the, uh, the properties of metals. Mm -hmm. And they had to look at why this phone was overheating to do all sorts of scientific experiments and then give their presentation to the board of directors. So again, in formal English. Right. So there was a lot of literacy involved but the outcome was actually a spoken language one. Mm -hmm. The kids did all the science experiments. And what we drew from that is that when you are looking at language-based teaching in the science, you need to look at the cognitive outcomes, the integrity of that subject area, and then everything follows from it. Mm -hmm. And we found also that when the science and the ESL teachers worked together, team teaching worked. They got on and they ended up, the EAL, the ESL teachers end up talking like science teachers. Mm -hmm. The science teachers were using the words like um, uh, lexical density, oh, scaffolding, to, all of the stuff. Jargons. Yes. Oh. So they yeah. learned from each other and it came about because we started from the subject itself, not from an abstract view mm -hmm. of language. Mm -hmm. Taking the, the most recent research into TESOL and looking at what it means in terms of content area teaching, and often the subjects, they're following the same research directions. Mm. But the, the takeaway message is that as a TESOL teacher, you cannot work in a subject area unless you know the concepts of that subject and the approaches to mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm, you know? mm -hmm. And again, like you probably realize that, you know, what, what you do actually is of interest to a lot of people in the area of um, English medium instruction, for example, mm. when, you know, the focus is on the content mm. um, and the language is part of it and, you know, they're sort of integrated that way. I think it's really important. Usually, I think there's been too much of a split between um, uh, well, what was traditionally TEFL and TESOL. Mm. I think there is now so much overlap between them. Mm. And one of the problems is that I think in EMI, sometimes the focus is too much on... Uh, sort of simplifying the content, whereas in actual fact, you need to look at the validity, the strength of the concept, but to look at the language that's possible from it, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And I think outcomes task-based is the best way to do it. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you for a very interesting uh, introduction to that. Uh, but, bef but before I talk more about, you know, ask you more about mm. your communi community language sort of project or, you know, mm. aspects of your profession. Um, how long have you been working on this project? Uh, this project, yep. it started with an ARC about 2007. Uh, this project itself started in 2016 and we've been working on it for about five, six years. Wow, so it's a long-term, longitudinal kind it's of... It's the biggest challenge, I think, in TESOL mm. because in Australia, the students do not have time to learn language by itself. They are in mainstream classes and they've got to learn language through the content mm -hmm, area. Mm -hmm. No choice. So you manage to track 
students over different years? Yes, yes, yes. And have you noticed any changes in students' learning or, or capacity? The schools where we chose the students, they were the lowest stream class in science, mm -hmm. and they're performing at or above the best. Oh, that's amazing. We have the data to show it. But most interesting is that the science teachers themselves all the results came back positive mm -hmm. in terms of what they felt about themselves. And many of them have gone on to become um, TESOL teachers themselves. Oh, okay, wow. No. So it's not just the students, it's no. also the teachers yeah. that will benefit from yeah. that have benefited. I think from so. This. Subject area teachers, once they learn about TESOL, they realize how important it is because mm -hmm. it's not just separating the TESOL students, it's actually teaching all of their students successfully. Mm -hmm. And native speakers of English benefit from these approaches. That's very inspirational. Yeah. Now, can you tell us more about the language community okay. uh, teaching and, and what, what drove your mo motives to, to in, you know, initiate doing um, this? We've been lucky to receive government funding that started six years ago. In Australia, there are something like 150,000 children learning their home language. Mm -hmm. 7,000 volunteer teachers. But in every country of the world, they exist. Every country where there's been migration, we estimate something like two and a half million students um, learning in these out of our schools. Mm -hmm. So in Australia, it's something like um, 72 languages being taught. We were funded by the government to develop research, to get resources for the teachers, and to provide pathways for the teachers for them to get accreditation mm -hmm. in Australia as mm -hmm. teachers. So that's what we've been doing, and that's what I've been taken up with for the last six years. That's why I haven't published it up on the TESOL project. Right, yet. okay. So I, I know it's... Because uh, you, you have the institute, right? Yes. As you set up. Can you tell us more about what's happening? Um, you know, the... You know, the, the people who work for you? We have about 75 part-time lecturers, researchers, mm -hmm. and we have a staff of four time for full time. Um, what we've done is that we now have a pathway for migrant professionals to become teachers in Australia. Mm -hmm. um, they We help them get their qualifications from overseas accredited. We have uh, a preparation course for them and they go on to do a Master of Teaching. We've had um, 70 so far and with the shortage of teachers we're going to get about another 200 through in the next year as teachers in mainstream schools. Mm. We also have um, resources for teaching the languages so you can look at our online portal www.openlanguage.org.au we have some 3,000 resources up there now in many languages Teachers can download them. We've had over 100,000 hits. Wow. Not just from Australia, but from Asia, North America. Mm -hmm. And it's um, up-to-date, um, evidence-based resources that are there. And the third thing is the, resort, the, the research into the schools themselves. We've um, looked at the teachers, their needs. We've looked at the organisation and the teaching in the schools. And we're trying to improve that, bring it more in line. Because the teachers are usually parents, volunteer parents, uh -huh. who start working in the schools. Mm -hmm. And that's what we've been working on. Mm. I know you have supervised a lot of PhD students and to succeed. And, and, and a lot of them became, you know, academics mm, and, and mm. so on in our view and teachers and mm. so on um, may, maybe if you could give us, us some advice you know like you know for for students so that they can be motivated you know mm. in terms of their study and so on any advice I think you like students come into PhDs with very different motivations. Mm -hmm. Some do it because they want to get a job in a uni. Others do it because they're not sure what they want to do. Others are interested in getting the qualification. Some are interested in going further in study. But if they can get through the first year and gain some confidence, when they start collecting their data, mm -hmm. it's when they actually look at their data and think, wow, this is what I'm finding. I think it's when they develop that sense of this is really interesting. I want to find, mm -hmm. What do I want to know that I didn't know before? Um, once they get that motivation, they will keep going. I guess it's hard 
in the students we supervise, and I know you do the same, mm -hmm. we try and get the students to work together to support each other. Mm -hmm. Sydney Uni is very good that way, mm -hmm. in that way, because you know and I know that doing a PhD can be really lonely. Mm -hmm. I think having peer support and sharing ideas with others, being able to talk about what you do, mm -hmm. is really good for motivation. Mm -hmm. It's hard keeping your motivation up. Often I advise students not to suspend because it's so easy to lose it. If they switch, say, from full-time to part-time, that's often better because it's hard juggling life, juggling family, juggling um, work. And un unexpected situations. Exactly. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I, this is not really a direct answer. It's not a simple thing of keeping up motivation. The ones who finish are usually the ones who are most directed, but your motivation changes along the way. Mm -hmm. I think if you can get... You know that you're going to finish when you start telling a friend about what you're doing and they fall asleep. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, because you're so excited yourself. Right. But you realise that it's here. You haven't sort of told other mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. I tell my students, talk to your dog, talk to your cat, talk to your partners or friends. Just tell them about it because once you are clear about what you're doing, that's where your motivation mm -hmm. comes from. Mm -hmm. Okay, one, one other thing in relation to, say, you know, students in my experience as well, is they have a lot of ideas, they have a lot of data, um, and often, you know, it would mean extra time to complete. What would be your advice on having a lot of data to be worked? Two things. It's our job as supervisors to say, too much, cut down. That's your scope. And you've got to imagine it as a race, maybe a one-kilometre race. Once you're over the line, you're finished. You don't have to use your, your data. Let go of some of it because you can look at it later. You have to realise when your supervisor says, this is enough, this is all you need to get the doctorate, mm -hmm. stop mm -hmm. because you're going to kill yourself. Um, <laughs> it's a, it, 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 there's a limit. And really, getting a PhD is joining the club of researchers and once you can prove that you've got good methodology that you can collect the data and do the findings you do not have to analyze everything that you've collected it's really just getting out of the line to show that you're good enough then your career starts mm -hmm. you look at all of that and you get to develop further it's just a line in your trajectory yeah Absolutely, I agree totally, mm, totally. Mm, uh, yeah. Still quite a challenge, right? I mean, you, know, well, you, you have done it, we have done it, but for students, often they don't realise that. I know, it's hard to let go. I did it yeah. with my own supervisor. He kept pulling it, saying, put it in, put it in, and I kept saying, no, I've got to finish, I've got to finish, but I was wrong. Yeah, right. You know, you've got to let go of it and look at it later. You know, well, it's a challenge that we have as supervisors. Yeah. It's really hard to say, stop. Because you can see that the researchers, the students, are so wedded and enthralled in what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And you say, look, get your PhD, and then you can go back. That's right. That, that's good advice. <laughs> okay. And I have one, probably one final question mm -hmm. for you, really. You know, as we want to focus on language teachers, mm -hmm. um, students, master students doing coursework in TESO area, what, what would you advise them in, their, in relation to their future career and um, what they should be look, looking out for? It's interesting because when you work with older teachers, I'm old now, but you see some are still enthusiastic and others are not. Mm -hmm. The enthusiastic ones keep learning mm -hmm. and it's when they try out things and keep um, reading but also learning from others so as a teacher it's the job where you learn as much from the students and what you do as you give mm -hmm. so I think mm -hmm. as a TESOL teacher it's interesting some teachers go straight into admin but I notice that TESOL teachers they often shift from job to different situations because they keep learning mm -hmm. It's a great pleasure to uh, have a conversation with you today. I have learned a lot about your current project and um, your advice uh, for for teachers and for students that are definitely invaluable for the Thank you, Ken. Thank you.